everyone! Welcome to this video. In this video, I'll be reacting to one of the early uploads from the YouTube channel The Game Terrorist. This video came out in the year 2015, so I think it's around 6 years ago. I'm a huge fan of their work and I hope that you enjoy this video as well. Let's start! Today, we're gonna touch on a subject that's long overdue. So overdue, in fact, that I've. Shut up! Been drowning in requests. Huh? Huh? See what I did there? Been drowning in requests. Ben drowned? <sighs> I'm talking about the Ben drowned creepypasta, okay? The story goes that on September 7th, 2010, a 4chan user by the name of Jaduzable posted about a strange Majora's Mask cartridge an old man had given him. Over the coming days, he began documenting at length all the strange things the cartridge was doing, including graphical glitches, over <laughs> <laughs> You've met with a terrible fate, haven't you? What's that? What's going on? You shouldn't have made a Ben Drowned theory. Wait a second, I know that voice. You're the Grape Jelly Player! Um... <laughs> Is that... so... <laughs> Wait, you are the... um... Yeah. Um... <laughs> The mystery opening, and then suddenly that, um... Peanut butter gamer, actually? Yeah, that's pretty much what I said. What are you doing here, again? Well, I've been messing around with Skyward Sword hacks, and I found a code that allows me to hack into any YouTube video that mentions Zelda. Whoa! <laughs> really? Is that like a part of YouTube Red? Uh, no? What are you even talking about? We're doing a collab video, remember? <laughs> oh, yeah, that's right. Sorry, I ran out of Diet Coke and my brain's been a bit fuzzy lately. Oh, that explains it. Explains what? Ben drowned? I mean, you're really scraping the bottom of the barrel here, man. Clearly you're not on form. I mean, I talked about Ben drowned like three years ago, and even then it was kind of old news. Well, do you have any better ideas, Mr. Butter Gamer? Wait, 2010, that's like 11 years ago. It's all old news already. <laughs> Actually, I do. Hello, Internet! Welcome to Game Theory! Hello! Yeah. Proudly riding the search trends of Peanut Butter Gamer's Zelda Month since 2013. And this year, over on his channel, for the top 8 useless Zelda items, I make no small issue about the absurdity of wallets in Zelda games. I mean, Link can shove a slingshot, a hoverboard, multiple bombs, two grappling hooks, and a giant ball and chain into his pants. But he has a limit on the number of rupees he can cram in there, too? Huh. I don't think so. But on the subject of rupees, one question the world wants to know is, how much are they worth in real life? I mean, who wouldn't want their very own rupee? They're so, so shiny. <laughs> the value <laughs> He also used a zooming effect, he's like, <gasps> And then I said, continue. A Zelda rupee is something I've wanted to tackle for a really long time. So long, in fact, that other YouTubers seem to have beat me to the punch. But my conclusions are going to be very different. So let's hop right in. Our first challenge here is figuring out what exactly a rupee is made out of. The first hint as to what their real-world equivalent is comes from the first game, The Legend of Zelda. Here, the game's intro screen refers to them as rupees, misspelled with an I. However, the manual calls them rubies, as in the red gemstone. But clearly that's a localization error, right? Ru Rupees are exclusively red, and in Zelda, rupees come in all sorts of different colors. Green, purple, blue, black. So even though the names are similar, they can't really be the same thing. Whoa, take off your bunny hood and slow down there, Nutella sportsman. The word ruby is actually just a fancy name for an impure form of the mineral corundum. The what is corundum? I'm not too sure. Do you know what's corundum? The viewers that is watching this video right now? Hmm. Something to learn 
Today. Second hardest mineral on earth after diamond. Pure corundum is colorless, but if an element like chromium is present when it's forming, this otherwise colorless mineral adopts a nice red color. This is what we know as a ruby. But if red jewelry is out of season, no worries. Corundum is also available in orange, blue, yellow, purple, green, black, pretty much any color of the rainbow or Zelda ruby. But Oh. But rubies are red, I hear you saying, and you're absolutely right, they are. These non-red corundum gems are actually called sapphires. Wait, what? It's crazy, isn't it? We normally think of sapphires as being blue gemstones, right? But they can also be yellow, purple, orange, green, pretty much any color depending on the <laughs> other elements that are present when the stone is forming. What? What? And get this, a sapphire and a ruby are no more different from each other than a blue diamond is from a red diamond. At the end of the day, the red and blue diamonds are still diamonds, made of the same material, carbon. Just like how red rubies and blue sapphires are still made of corundum. We just call them fancy names based on their color. Okay, Mr. Game Hypothesizer, see I can play the call the special guest a weird name game too. What makes you so sure that they're not made of any other mineral? Well, the shape. Is that, is, okay, guy. Uh, okay, Mr. Game Hypothesizer is not game theorist. <laughs> Minerals can fall into one of seven crystal families depending on the way their atoms tend to arrange themselves. Things like pyrite and diamonds tend to form cubes, so they fall into the cubic family. The other families are triclinic, monoclinic, orthorhombic, tetragonal, and hexagonal. Depending on the game, Zelda rupees are either shaped like hexagonal by pyramids or hexagonal by frusta. Either way you slice it, Zelda rupees clearly fall into the hexagonal family. And guess which family corundum just so happens to belong to he's not paying attention <laughs> he's doing collab videos <laughs> he's doing a collab video and he's not paying attention <laughs> That's right, hexagonal. That's another score for corundum. Okay, so we're limited to only members of the hexagonal family. That narrows it down. But what about emeralds, aquamarines, and morganite? They're all fancier names for the mineral barrel, and they come in almost the same colors as corundum. Oh, I had no idea you cared so much about minerals. That rocks. Pun definitely intended. That rocks. Literally rocks. Literally rocks. Get it? Because... The uh, rocks, get it? <laughs> oh, I don't. I was just reading off a Wikipedia article I pulled up when I got bored listening to you. Okay. Oh. Well, sure, Beryl is a fine candidate, but we haven't brought up the last piece of evidence. Pleochroism. Leoplorodon? It's a Leoplorodon, Charlie. A magical Leoplorodon. Pleochroism. It's an optical illusion that only certain gems are able to create. We're changing the angle you're viewing the gemstone from will subtly shift the color of the stone. Wait, wait, wait. What? How, how do they pronounce the words again? Gems are able to... It's a Leoplorodon, Charlie. A magical Leoplorodon. Pleochroism. 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 Pleochorism. Wow. I do not know how to pronounce that word. I didn't know it even it even existed. Hmm. It's an optical illusion that only certain gems are able to create. We're changing the angle you're viewing the gemstone from will subtly shift the color of the stone. Crystallographers not only use it to determine the price of a gemstone, but also use it to determine what sort of gemstone they're looking at. Sim I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Did you just say crystal something, something, something? Determine the gems are able to create. We're changing the angle you're viewing the gemstone uh -huh. from will subtly shift the color of the stone. Crystallographers... Crystallosophers. Uh, that means crystallosophers, people who spend a lot of time on crystals, study crystals, know about a lot of crystals, understand crystals, I think. Hmm. I didn't know that you said. Not only use it to determine the price of a gemstone, but also use it to determine what sort of gemstone they're looking at. Simply turning a gem in your hand can be a really easy way to find out whether you're looking at, say, a green emerald or a green sapphire. Now, if you look at any high-res rupee found in Ocarina of Time, you can see that as they rotate, their colors darken and lighten. That's textbook pleochroism. Oh! Um, 
Minerals like diamond and garnet don't do this, but gem quality corundum does. In fact, corundum is one of the only minerals that not only comes in multiple colors, but also exhibits moderate to strong pleochroism no matter what color it is. No matter what color it is. Wow. Beryl also exhibits pleochroism, but not at the level corundum is able to achieve, and certainly not to the level that we see it exist in the game. In short, from the name, to the color variety, to the crystal structure, to the refraction, all sources point towards the fact that rupees are indeed rubies and sapphires. Corundum-based gemstones. Alright, I- Corundum-based gem- gemstones. Corundum based gemstones. Wow. They rock. Get it? Alright, rupees are rubies. Discovery of the century. Oh, how we marvel at how smart and insightful you are. But cut the chase. How much are these guys worth? Well, to calculate that, we're gonna have to find their height, volume, and density. In the Majora's Moon episode, I calculated Young Link's height at just over 4 foot 2 inches. Wait, wasn't he 10 feet tall? No, no, that was Wario. <laughs> oh, my bad. No, not <laughs> Mario. Yours, mine, definitely mine. So we can use Link's height to calculate the length of all the edges of the in-game rupees, and then use those numbers to calculate the area of the hexagonal base, and use that number to calculate the volume of the entire rupee. Easy peasy, PBGBs. Sounds super exciting. I'm just gonna be over here playing Triforce Heroes to help me concentrate. So, yep, yep, she's definitely serious about it. Sounds so interesting! Only measures in at 4 feet 2 inches, and the in game rupees are almost half that size at just over 2 feet or 61.51 centimeters tall, and measuring apex to apex 5 inches or 12.7 centimeters wide. I'm glad that he always uh, includes um, the. Uh, I'm glad that sometimes you he, he sometimes you always includes um also, sometimes you includes the um, the um, both systems of measurements so that people of the outside of his main community in the United States of America will understand it. Life all about me. I'm. Outside. Since the base of the rupee is a hexagon with three sets of parallel edges, that makes calculating its area much easier. It can be divided into two perfectly congruent isosceles trapezoids. So we only need to find the area of one trapezoid and then multiply it by two. Reflexive property for the win. So the area of a trapezoid is base one plus base two divided by two multiplied by height. Base one is 15.5 inches, base two is 24.22 inches, and the height is 2.5 inches. Plugging the numbers in, we get 49.65 inches squared, and since, as we said, we have two trapezoids, the total area of the base of the rupee is 99.3 square inches, or 640.64 square centimeters. Oh boy! Time for the volume. Oh, can I read this part of the script, please? I haven't had enough speaking lines yet. Knock yourself out. The volume of a bipyramid is two-thirds base area times height. We already know our base area is 99.3 square inches, and our height from base to apex is 2.5 inches, so plugging the numbers in, we get 165.5 cubic inches, or 2,712.05 cubic centimeter. Just a moment, why do you have to use this kind of voice when you are speaking about these measurements? Thank you so much. That sounds so weird. Like seriously, it sounds so weird, lah. That was fun! Can I do this more often? Anytime, my friend. Since rupees are colored, that means that they're impure forms of corundum. The density of impure corundum varies because, well, it's impure. But the density of sapphire tends to be around 65.22 grams per cubic inch, or 3.98 grams per cubic centimeter. That means, get this, we have 10,793.9 grams, or 24 pounds of green sapphire on our hands for a single rupee. Jeez, forget about iron boots. Just strap your giant's wallet to your back and you'll sink faster than a sack of Gorons. The price for a green sapphire is anywhere between $250 and $760 per carat. Now, using what we learned about crystallography from the Minecraft Diamond Armor episode, we can assume that these opaque green rupees are gonna skew towards the lower end of that price range. Meaning that, drumroll please, we're finally able to get the value of a single green Ocarina of Time rupee, which is, get this, an astonishing 13,492,448 dollars and 75 cents. Back then, you know, this calculation, this video is back in 2015, right now it's 2021. 
the sexiest part. No wonder Link goes around smashing everyone's pots to find these things. Man, really puts into perspective how much you're paying for that refill of bombs. Vegemite competitor, you truly are a beautiful gem of a human being. Thanks for having me on, Cartridge Guesser. And thank you for having me on your channel to complain about wallets and other stupid items. Game Cherry? Cartridge guess Guesser? <laughs> Alright, so let's continue. Like magic armor, which, now knowing the value of a rupee, makes even less sense. Ugh, it gets me upset just thinking about it. You should mention that they can go watch our other video by clicking the spinning rupee right there. I think you just did, my friend. I think you just did. Mm. But hey, that's just a theory. A game, game theory. theory. Thanks for, for watching. watching. I wonder how many times have they tried to sing this? <laughs> they, they tried to attend this to sing this to sing their voice together. But seriously, click that rupee. You'll be glad you did. We're pretty hilarious. And while you're at it, subscribe to both our channels since we're cool guys who do cool videos about cool games. <laughs> or at least that's what Matt Pat told me to say anyway. Personally, I'm not so sure about the cool part. Well, cool guys is a relative term. We did just spend a couple paragraphs analyzing the dimensions, volume, and density of fictional video game currency, and then nerding out over geometric formulas. So, cool by internet standards, I guess? Maybe? And speaking of excessive amounts of money, last time on the Super Amazing End Card Tournament, when asked whether you wanted to find your true soulmate or $10 million in cash, 62% of you chose true love, a soulmate, whereas everyone else voted for cash. $10 million, though, still not gonna get you a single green rupee from Legend of Zelda. Crazy. This time, no vote. Just check out the video over on PBG's channel, or if you want more Zelda math, click over here to see me analyze one of my favorite Zelda items of all time, the hook shot, and find out why it's perhaps the most deadly item in Link's arsenal. Oh, but not to the enemy, to Link himself. <laughs> Alright, thank you so much for watching this video. Thanks for having me on, Cartridge Guesser. Cartridge Guesser. <laughs> I think that's it. I did it. I did it. Yeah. <laughs> Alright, um, thank you so much for watching this video. If you do like this video, please consider to like, share, and subscribe to my channel. And comment down below if you have anything to share with us. The video that Jason reacted to was a YouTube channel from the YouTube, uh, from the YouTube video, uh, was a YouTube video from the YouTube channel The Game Theorists. And I hope that you will show support and appreciation for their work. Their videos are really adorable, fantastic, amazing, just educational, or all, all in all, family friendly. Yeah, and I hope that just you just show appreciation, just love, uh, watch our videos. Yeah, how am I doing? Blah. <laughs> and thank you so much. I hope to see you uh, in my next video. See you next time. And remember, that's just a theory, a game theory. Thanks for watching.